Hey everybody, uh, my name is Derek. I'm the lead pastor at Journey Church and I want to thank you for being a part of one of our Recalculate groups. Uh, this is the fourth and final week and thanks so much for sticking with it to this point. I hope that what we've been talking about is helpful to you and has been great uh, for you to discuss with some of the others in your group. You know, the famous Greek philosopher Aristotle once said that uh, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence then is not an act but a habit. Forrest Gump's mama said it this way, stupid is as stupid does. In other words, uh, everything that we do, every decision we make, and every, moment by moment, day by day, hour by hour, as we make these decisions in our lives, they add up to give us a direction and a focus for our lives. You know, we've been talking in this series and asking the question, wouldn't it be great if we could have a GPS for our life, a place where we could kind of plug in our situation, plug in our circumstances, plug in our decision that we had to make and somehow get a, a route kind of spit out to us that we could follow. We believe that there is something that can help us make those decisions and help us to take those directions. And that's the Holy Spirit that God wants to give us divine direction in our lives. And we realize that the way that that happens is usually day by day. And decision by decision, you know, someone once said that your life is the result of the choices that you have made. And so day by day and uh, moment by moment and decision by decision, we end up where we end up. You know, if you want to have a, a great marriage or a great relationship, that happens day by day, decision by decision, as you uh, choose things that are going to help to grow and strengthen your marriage and strengthen your relationship. If you want to have financial health, it happens through those decisions about spending and versus saving and paying off debt and, 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 and you know, controlling your credit cards or even steering clear of them if you need to. And it's through taking those steps and daily by daily choosing, you know, to go through the drive through or not to go through the drive through that you don't always have to run to the mall just because they say that there's a sale on. Whatever those things are, when you make those small decisions, they add up to large uh, outcomes uh, over time. Same thing with your physical health, that daily decision to go to the gym or to say, I'm going to get there at least four times a week. And, and even the days that you don't want to go when you decide to go or that decision decision to step away from the dessert or to uh, eat healthier, any of the things that we do to try and get ourselves in better physical shape, taking vitamins, uh, all of those things, getting enough sleep. When we decide to do those things and when we don't fudge on them, when we don't uh, waver on those things, those decisions make a difference. They make an impact in our lives because we know this, that decisions become directions and directions become destinations. When we, uh, the decisions we make are going to set us off on a path, they're going to lead us in a, in a direction, and ultimately those directions are going to take us somewhere, they're going to lead us to a destination. And so we're talking about how do we make good short-term decisions today that are going to lead us to the place where we want to be tomorrow. You know, we talked a couple weeks ago about the story of the prodigal son. It's probably one of Jesus' most well-known stories. It's found in the Gospel of Luke chapter 15. And Jesus is illustrating in this story about the fact that we, uh, we have the ability to, to return to God and that he welcomes us home with forgiveness and acceptance. It's a great and it's a powerful story. But that story is full of decisions. It's the story about a young man who, who asks his father for his share of his inheritance now, leaves home, goes, the Bible, Luke tells us that he, he blows all the money on what he calls wild living. Uh, later we find out that there's prostitution and other things involved. He's just out there going buck wild and he loses everything he has and he ends up working on a pig farm somewhere. And he's starving, he's alone, he doesn't have much going on for him. But eventually he decides to go home and not ask his father if he can come back in as a son, move back into his old room, get some of his inheritance money back. He says, I can't, I've, I've blown that, I've ruined that chance. But I can ask my dad for a job because he treats his employees way better than this pig farmer treats me. And so he goes home and instead of being given a job, he's given an embrace and his father brings it back home. It's a powerful story. And if you're not familiar with it, I encourage you sometimes to sit down and read through Luke chapter 15. You'll, you'll love this story and it'll really speak to your heart. But I realized as I read that story, how much of that story was built around decisions. Uh, initially, this young man decides he wants to get out from underneath his dad's roof. He wants to get out there and see the world, live it up, uh, uh, you know, do it all, get, go there, buy the t-shirt, everything that you can do. 
And so that's, so he starts to make some decisions. His first decision, he says, dad, I, he has to finance this endeavor. So he says, dad, I want all of my share of the inheritance now, which had to have been a pretty uh, brazen thing to say. He was basically saying to his dad, I wish you were dead. Because if you were dead, then I could get my inheritance. But you're not dead. So I'd like my money now, please. And his father gives it to him. And that leads to his next decision now. And that's to leave home. That's what he wanted to do. And now he has the resources to do it. So he leaves home. And then he decides to hang out with the wild crowd and to party and to, ha and, and to have a great time. And he ends up losing everything. And Luke tells us in the story that he ends up working on a pig farm. He's alone. He's broke. And he's starving. In fact, Luke says... Even the food that he was feeding the pigs looked good to him. He was so hungry. And then one day, Luke tells us this in Luke 15. He says, the young man came to his senses. It was like all of a sudden, it just he realized, he kind of like somehow maybe almost stepped outside himself and looked at his life and thought, how in the world did I get here? Well, he got there through some decisions that he had made. So he started making different decisions. And, the, and Luke tells us that he decided to go home to his father's house that he decided that he was going to ask his father for a job because he didn't think he, he could get back in the house as a son, but maybe as a servant. And then he went home and he experienced it. And he made the decision that he was going to eat some crow if it meant getting a roof over his head and getting some food in his stomach. And, and he goes home and he's accepted in a totally different way. But it's so powerful to realize how many decisions went into that story because our lives are really the result uh, of our choices and the result of the decisions that we make. If we want to experience, I believe that if we want to experience God's divine direction in our lives, if we want him to, to lead us step by step, then we uh, need to think about how do we make the decisions that we make. And a couple of weeks ago when we talked about this, I shared about a book that I just read that was written uh, last fall by a pastor and an author named Andy Stanley. And the book is called Better Decisions, Fewer Regrets. And he talk, Andy Stanley talks about how important it is that we have a process or a grid that we kind of filter our decisions through. And he talks about five key questions that we need to ask ourselves when we're making decisions. The first question is this, am I being honest with myself, really? Am I being honest with myself, really? You know what I found, and maybe you know this as well, but I believe it to be true. The person that we uh, lie to the most and lie to sometimes the easiest is ourselves. In fact, oftentimes I found this, I have to lie to myself before I can, I can lie to somebody else. I have to kind of convince myself that it's okay before I try and convince someone else. You know, I have a friend who used to always say this to me. He said, Derek, your mind will always find a way to justify what your heart desires. I believe that that we can see that all again in the story from the prodigal of the prodigal son in Luke 15, where he uh, found he had to have told himself a lot of lies. He had to kind of deceive himself a lot to justify why he wanted the money from his dad, why he wanted to go off on a trip on his own and get away from his family, why it was okay to hang out with these people, why, 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 and then all of a sudden Luke says in Luke 15 he says, one day the young man came to his senses. I believe that's almost another way of saying that he asked himself that question. Why am I being honest with myself really? He began to look at his situation and began to be honest. Stop justifying it to himself. Stop coming up with excuses or reasons why he was living on a pig farm. And he, he got real, got honest with himself. And that honesty allowed him to begin to make different decisions and led him back home. And so uh, when we ask ourselves that question, Am I being honest with myself? Really, we need to make a decision. And the decision we need to make is this. I will not lie to myself, even if the truth makes me feel bad about myself. I'm not going to lie to myself, even if the truth makes me feel bad about myself. I know I have lied to myself because about why I wasn't talking to that person or about why I was handling this situation the way I was or why I was quitting or why I was doing this or why I was doing that. And I lied to myself because if I looked at the true answer, it made me feel bad about myself. And so we need to be willing to ask ourselves that question and then make a decision. And, 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 and that decision is that I will not lie to myself, even when the truth makes me feel bad about myself. A second question that we can ask ourselves is this. What story do I want my life to tell? What story do I want to tell? Uh, every decision that we make, as we talk, as I mentioned earlier, someone once said, your life is the result of all of your choices. When we make decisions, those, those 
decisions cumulatively come together and really become the, the storyline of our lives. Even when our, our life story includes things that happen to us, things that we didn't do, maybe things we didn't want, a divorce we didn't want, uh, a betrayal we didn't want, an illness we didn't want, uh, getting fired from a job we didn't want, that these things, and you say, well, Derek, my story includes a bunch of things that happened to me. It's not just decisions I've made, it's things that have happened to me. But even in those moments, we have to decide, okay, this has happened to me. Now, what story do I want my life to tell? Do I want the story to be, this happened to me and so I gave up? Uh, this happened to me, so I went and I walked away from, from my family and, and I walked away from those relationships. This happened to me, so I turned my back on God. We have the, you know, we have the decision to make, uh, uh, we have the power and the ability to have our decisions add up to a story that we want to tell. We can also tell stories that say, this happened to me, but I didn't give up. Uh, you know, this happened in my our marriage, but I didn't walk away. I fought for our, our marriage. And because we came together and fought for our marriage, now here we are 20 years later, still married, and life is better than ever. We all get the opportunity to tell a story with our lives. You know, one of the privileges that I have as a pastor is to officiate funerals. And I say a privilege because I think it's such a powerful time to uh, try and be there to help and to care for people in, in, a, in a really difficult time in their lives. And and whenever I gather with a family to, to prepare to do a, a funeral for their loved one, I always ask them, I just begin to ask them, tell me about, tell me about them. Tell me about your grandpa. Tell me about your wife. Tell me about your, 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 uh, your cousin, whoever, whatever the relationship is, tell me about them. And I hear those stories. So I think not only about this question, not only what story do I want to tell, but what story do I want others to tell about me? And so a decision that we can make is to say, I am going to, uh, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to write the story. I, I, I want told one decision at a time. I'm going to write out the, I'm gonna, I want to tell my story one decision at a time. So we can ask ourselves, you know, how honest am I being with myself really? And we can also ask the question, what story do I want to tell? The third question we can ask ourselves is this, is there a tension that I need to give attention to? Is there a tension in me that I need to give attention to? Is there something, is there kind of a check? You know, is there kind of that feeling in my gut that says, uh, you know, I, this is the decision I think I'm gonna make, but there's just something that's not sitting right with it. Or maybe a friend has said, are you sure you wanna do this? Or maybe when you hear that little voice in the back of your head saying, is this the right thing to do? And maybe that voice sounds just like your mom. But you maybe have had times where you've listened to that voice. There have been other times maybe where you've ignored that voice. And how has that affected you? And how has that affected those decisions? It doesn't mean we need to give in to every one of those impulses, but it means we, we can't just shut those things off or, or plug our ears and pretend like we're not hearing them. Is there a tension in this decision that I need to give attention to? In the Old Testament, there's the story of David who was uh, chosen to be the next king of Israel. But the current king of Israel uh, was trying to eliminate and, and, and kill David so that he wouldn't uh, lose his throne to David. And he was hunting him. And David was on the run. David and a group of his, he had this kind of little army around him. And they were basically running for their lives. And Saul was trying to hunt them down. And one time in a cave in the dark where no one else could see, David had the perfect opportunity to kill Saul. But he didn't take it. Instead, he snuck up behind him and he cut off a part of his robe. And I think he was going to think that maybe he could flaunt that and show Saul how he held his life in his hands. And he could have taken his life, but he chose not to. But the Bible says uh, that, that even in that moment, it says that after he did that, Saul felt or, or David felt something in his conscience. And he was he was kind of troubled in his conscience that he had even done that because Saul was the king of Israel. He was God's chosen one. And, so, and David thought, man, what right do I have to go up and cut off his robe? Uh, and he told his men, in fact, he stopped his men from going any further. We all need to be in a place in our lives that when we feel that, that whether it's our uh, prick in our conscience or a, just that, that uh, voice of the Holy Spirit saying to us, are you sure? that just that gnawing feeling sometimes in our gut that we are willing to ask ourselves the question, why do I feel this tension? It doesn't mean that we always give in to it, but it means that we don't uh, just ignore it. Um, in, in the decision that we can make there is to say this, I will explore rather than ignore that tension uh, when I'm feeling it. I'm going to explore rather than ignore that tension whenever I feel it. How am I doing? And what am, am I being honest with myself really? What story do I want to tell? 
Is there attention uh, that I need to give attention to? And then the last couple of questions real quick. The question number four is this. Uh, question four, just ask a simple question. What is the wise thing to do? That means we don't ask what is the easy thing to do? What's the convenient thing to do? Not even what's the legal or allowable thing to do because there are things that are legal and allowable, but that doesn't make them right and it doesn't necessarily make them wise. What is the wise thing for me to do in this situation? Uh, wisdom and foolishness as defined in the Bible are not about intelligence, they're not about education, and it's not even about street smarts. It's about applying what we know to be right in a way that's gonna be beneficial to our lives now and in the future. A way that we can kind of expand this question is to ask it this way. In light of my past experiences and my current situation and my future hopes and dreams, what is the wise thing to do? Look back. Think about maybe when you've been in a place like this in the past and the decisions you make, what's wise compared to those decisions? Think about your current situation, all the factors that you're aware of. What's the wise thing to do here? Maybe not what's the fun or easy thing to do, but what's the wise thing to do here? And then when you think about your future, what your hopes and dreams are, what's the wise decision that you can make today that's going to lead to those hopes and dreams tomorrow? We can make the decision that we will act in wisdom, that we will ask ourselves uh, that question, and that we will make wise choices based on our past, our present, and our future. And the fifth and final question we can ask ourselves is this, and I think it's the most important question, and that's this question. What is it that love requires of me? You know, for the past two Sundays at Journey, we've referenced uh, a, a, a verse in John chapter 13, where Jesus said to his disciples, I'm going to give you a new command for your life, a new commandment for your life. They had hundreds of commandments from the Old Testament law, but Jesus said, I'm going to give you one simple commandment. It's only three words, love each other love each other. All of the all of the commandments are kind of summed up in this love God and love each other. And so that's how he told them to do that. And when we ask that question, what does love require of me? The question, that reminds us that the decisions that we make for our lives don't just affect us. In fact, I, I, I don't think I make very many decisions at all. And I don't think you do either that only affect you. Almost every decision that you make has ripple effect that impacts the people around us in our marriage, in our family, among our friends, our coworkers, the people we go to school with. All of our decisions impact others. And so when we ask this question about what does love require of me, it reminds us that our decisions matter not just to us, but also to the people around us. So the decision that we can make there is that I will make my decisions in love and I will think about how my decisions have an impact on the people around me. So there are five simple questions that we can ask ourselves as we make decisions and allow God to guide us step by step. The first question we can ask ourselves is this, am I being honest with myself really? Second question, what story do I want my life to tell? The third question, is there a attention that I need to give attention to? The fourth question, what's the wise thing to do? And finally, and I think most importantly, number five, what does love require of me? You know, our guiding uh, passage for this entire series is Proverbs 16, 9, which says, we make plans, but God directs our steps. And I believe that God directs our steps. Steps are small incremental moves and that are part of a bigger plan for our lives. And as God directs our steps, he does that decision by decision and moment by moment. And when we ask the right questions, we can make better decisions, God-directed decisions that allow us to end up exactly where he wants us to be. Thanks again for joining us for this series. And I hope you have a great time of discussion with the rest of the folks in your group.